that has been operating these tours for over 60 years. This uh, national park, uh, Water and Lakes National Park, was initially established in 1895 as a forest reserve, but it wasn't officially declared a national park until 1911. We're also the world's first international peace park. We're a world biosphere reserve, a natural UNESCO World Heritage Site. And then just a couple years ago, we were declared the world's first international dark sky preserve. So we're a pretty unique place. Our tour, we take you down this upper Waterton Lake all the way to the international border into Glacier National Park. And previous years, we would land at the south end, a place called Goat Haunt, Montana, and allow you to go for some day hiking opportunities. And then we would take you back here on our cruise vessel. Entering into the great state of Montana, big sky country, Glacier National Park. And what a beautiful day it is here in the National Park. Lake. A little bit breezy, but uh, not a cloud in the sky. It's five adult passengers. And therefore, we have 128 adult life jackets on board. Life jackets you'll find are located beneath your seats here inside the main cabin. Coke sitting on front locker. Small children or infant life jackets are located right up at the helm. We have first aid supplies on board. We have firefighting equipment. Life rings are located strategically throughout the vessel. And on the upper deck, we're equipped with two self-inflating Zodiac-like platforms. The two big white barrels upstairs. So should the unthinkable happen, then we had to abandon ship here. And in the next hour and 15 minutes, we would deploy those two big white barrels. They would both sell instructions, and your crew will take very good care of you. The crew had enough of the wind upstairs, and they ventured down by all means. More people can experience that upper deck. Zachariah will be keeping an eye on that. And he's also available in here on the tour boats and on the hiking trails for well over the past decade. With a great deal exploring this wilderness area, hiking all the trails, climbing all the mountains, and spending countless nights camped out in the backcountry. 
I certainly would like to pass on some of those experiences today, kind of give you a local's perspective, a local's appreciation for this beautiful national park. Elaborate on your interests, and we can personalize this tour. If you don't ask questions, well, I'll probably just talk about stuff that interests me. So feel free to do so. I encourage it. I will say, though, I will not talk for the entire trip. I'll periodically set the microphone down, and I'd like to give you some time to yourselves, your friends, your family. Enjoy the company of one another and take in all this majestic mountain scenery without the sound of my voice. And on the return trip home, I will set that microphone down for an extended period of time so I can do just that. To start off, though, I would encourage you to scan the shores. Your eyes built for wildlife. Now, Captain Christoph, Christoph has us on a bit of a great circuit here. Correct. Sometimes we'll see coyotes, we've seen wolves before, the fox. You never quite know what you'll see. I've been working for this company for quite a few years. About seven, eight years ago now, we're coming down the lake on our evening cruise in almost like the water. We've seen mountain lion out here before, the cougar, the muck ghost cat, they go by many different names. They are our top predator in the national park. We also have bobcat in the area. Some of the weasels, we have the pine martin, the fisher, and the largest member of the weasel family, that would be the wolverine. Scientific name, gulo gulo, meaning glutton. They've been documented to chase a grizzly off a kill site. A 45 pound wolverine giving chase to a 600 pound grizzly bear. So they're incredibly ferocious, but also incredibly rare. In all my years exploring this wilderness area, I've only been fortunate enough to see one wolverine in all those years. So very elusive, very rare in these parts. But keep your eyes peeled, who knows what we'll see today and the more eyes we have scanning the shores, the better chances that we will see something. Just looking at the color of the water off our left, you'll notice how quickly this lake drops off. A hop, a skip, a jump, and you'll be well over your head in water. Average depth, 220 feet or 80 meters. The deep spot sounded at 487 feet. 148 meters down to the bottom. Makes this the deepest natural lake in the Canadian Rockies. So good question, what kind of fish do we have here? We have a total of 24 different types of fish species. 17 of which are native to the area. So we have every type of trout here besides the golden trout. So the lake trout are the Mackinac, they're the common catch. That's what the anglers will typically fish for. They grow the largest. Bull trout, they are our protected species here. Fishing season is all wrapped up for the year. It runs from the May long weekend to Labor Day long weekend. What's the average temperature of the water? So another question up front here, what's the temperature of the water? Right now, this late in the season, it's about uh, 10 degrees Celsius. So it's about uh, low 50s Fahrenheit. Peak season right in the middle of August. It probably got up to about 15 degrees Celsius or just shy of 60 Fahrenheit. That's as warm as this lake will get. It's a glacier fed lake. There's still three active glaciers feeding it, countless snow fields, but due to the depth, the constant wind action, it doesn't warm up all that much. Very refreshing. Maybe to start, just stick a hand in and get a feel of how cold this lake really is. To drain all this water, though, the shape of this lake would resemble your bathtub at home, so it's a very distinctive U shape. It's very steep on the sides, rounds it off to the middle like the letter U. And that's just very representative of a glacially carved lake. As the geologists tell us, this area experienced four separate periods of glaciation. The last glacial advance is believed to have occurred here. They were mountains of their own, thousand foot high glaciers. Taking up most of these valleys, you see, like the one off our right, this U-shaped valley was a minor glacier working to this way down to this central glacier that carved out this entire upper water valley, pushing out towards the plains or the prairies. 
like sandpaper on wood, glaciers are very abrasive. And they sculpted this landscape as we see here today. Just looking off our right hand side, I don't normally point it out, but uh, this is the Bertha Valley. Bertha Lake's up there, you go for a hike, but uh, way up to the top of the mountain up there, you'll notice a beautiful golden forest. Those are called the larch trees, and they're just starting to turn. I was just looking up there the other day, and they were kind of a more of a lime green color, but they're just starting to go now almost into that gold. So great time to be here in the fall. Watch the changing of the seasons. Most of the deciduous trees haven't really changed yet. We've had a pretty mild September. Pretty nice weather. Lots of moisture. So the trees down here haven't really turned yet. We have people of all ages and abilities doing this hike. It's not too intense. We got six-year-old kids doing it. We got an 80-year-old gentleman still walking up there. So it just depends on what you're comfortable with and your personal abilities. You can. We'll see you tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. But on that side of the lake, you'll notice it's quite the difference in the forest, quite the contrast. The forest on our right-hand side burned back in 2017. This is all the aftermath of the Kenal Mountain Wildfire, the largest and the most devastating, more resilient than before. But it will take time, perhaps a lifetime. It's interesting because the mentality on forest fires certainly has changed over the years. 40, 50 years ago, forest fires were considered Douglas fir trees over a very, very long time for those soils to regenerate and for the forest to return after. You also see here on our left a lot of trees appear sickly. Some of them are completely without needles. Others appear wet as you temporarily increase their sap flow to flush out those insects and stave off that infestation. And that's just one example of how Mother Nature will regulate the health of the forest if man chooses to intervene and suppress fires as we have done in the past. Everything here is connected. Another positive note after the events of the fire of 2017 is we're now learning a lot more about our very rich native history. Parks Canada and their archaeologists in collaboration will take it all in. I'll come around and check everyone's passports now. <laughs> of course, I just, like I said, this will be the easiest border crossing you do anytime soon. No passports required, no questions will be asked. So you can cross the border just like that, do a donut on the border. No worries. That's all thanks to this place being the world's first international peace park. That was formed back in 1932 as the Rotarians from the local districts of Alberta and Montana lobbied their respective federal governments. They lobbied them with the slogan, nature sees no boundaries, so why should man? After all, when a bear approaches the border, he doesn't identify as a Canadian bear, resembling the blades of a saw, while the traditional native name, the Blackfoot name, Perfectly fine. I've been drinking from all these creeks, streams, and lakes all my life. I've never gotten sick. I don't filter my water. Regardless, some pretty fresh, clean water found here coming right off the glaciers and the snow fields. Just up ahead of us to our left in this U-shaped valley, there's a mountain in the distance called argillite. It has a degree of iron content in the rock that's been oxidized at its time of exposure. And to stay longer than the 30-minute stop, go do some day hiking, catch a later boat back, or perhaps spend the night. Then you'd have to clear U.S. Customs. You'd have to have a passport. That's an official port of entry into the United States. But unfortunately, goat hunt's been closed for the last number of years, the last four years, first couple of years because of staffing constraints, and then the pandemic happened, and they shut goat hunt down for good.
history of this area. Unfortunately, our international is under repairs this year. Hopefully we'll have her back ready for service next season. The hotel, the oldest wooden structure in Alberta, the view from the hill, as you can see those people doing, it's quite spectacular. So check it out. If you like to go for a short rewarding hike, I'd recommend the Bear's Hump. Let's go our left hand side, this rounded off portion, little ways up the mountain. You can hike all the way up there. One mile, you'll gain 800 feet in elevation, so it's pretty steep. But when you get to the top, you'll be well rewarded with an outstanding view of this entire upper water and valley that's well worth checking out. That is called the Bear's Hump. 30, 45 minutes will get you up there for the average hiker one way. How long does it take to grab up the camera lane? For the scenic drives, all of them take about 30 to 40 minutes drive one way. Do some shopping, check out some of the shops, take a walk along our main street. That's where most of the businesses are located, but things are slowing down here. I think just today, Subway closed at lunchtime. Trappers Mountain Grill closed this morning after breakfast. So a lot of businesses are closing up shop for the year. We're going to be open for another week here at the boats at least. We'll try and go to Canadian Thanksgiving if the weather's good. But who knows, we could get a big blizzard in just a few days. Thumbs theory on the Main Street. My name is Michael. If you did not, my name is Rod. On Facebook. Nice beer. Nice beer. Yeah. 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 Ye